Today we're going to make a variation on a classic, the Aku Aku Zombie. For this drink, you're going to need a tiki mug, or a zombie glass, a jigger, a measuring spoon, a cocktail shaker, and a Lewis bag and an ice mallet. This drink uses gold Cuban style rum, dark Jamaican rum, 151 Demerara rum, cinnamon syrup, grapefruit juice, lime juice, aromatic bitters, zombie mix, and mint for garnish. The zombie is a tiki classic, and has been ever since it was introduced in 1934. Its popularity was part of the initial appeal of tiki bars. The fantastical decor, unique atmosphere, and exotic drinks helped. But for a lot of early guests, the zombie was the hook. A double zombie with a scotch chaser. It helped put tiki bars in the spotlight. But the drink was named after a creature that was fairly new to pop culture at the time. And the 1930s idea of a zombie was very different from what it is today. For nearly a hundred years, our pop culture notion of a zombie has been an outlet in times of social upheaval, uncertainty, and hopelessness. However, in the 21st century, the idea of zombies bringing about the end of the world as we know it almost comes as a relief. From your couch, a world of scarcity and broken supply chains seems preferable to the slow rot and dull ache of the world you live in. When the cost of having creature comforts comes with the pressure of bills, payments, debt, getting pumped full of ads that make you feel bad, a draining commute to a crushing job to prop up the vanishing horizons of what's left of your life, all of a sudden the zombie apocalypse doesn't sound so bad. Survival in that world is a breath of fresh air compared to the crushing banality of your boring, pointless existence. Everything you do in the zombie world is exciting and has total, crystal, and immediate purpose. Obviously, you're not one of the faceless bodies piled up on the side of the road who died of disease or starvation. No, in this fantasy, you get to cast yourself as the hero who goes on brave adventures, gets to feast on a diet of guilt-free bloodlust, and help your fellow survivors fight another day. And in this world, everyone's grateful to have you around. But the zombie didn't start off as fodder for a suburban hero fantasy camp. It evolved from something much darker. The zombies from the movies trace their origins back to 17th century Saint-Domingue, now known as Haiti, where an army of slave labor spun sugar into gold. Being officially a Catholic colony, West African religions were banned. So out of necessity, the Africans shaped, twisted, and folded aspects of Catholicism into their religious practices, which eventually evolved into Haitian voodoo. And out of this, our modern understanding of zombies was born. In Saint-Domingue, zombies were highly feared. Zombies! Allez vite! Allez! Not so much of being attacked by one, but rather of becoming one. A zombie was a slave beyond the grave. And for someone spending their life enslaved, the only thing worse that they could possibly imagine would be to remain in chains in the afterlife. This fear was used by the slave drivers to keep the slaves from killing themselves. Thus the fear of zombies kept the labor force in line. At least that was, until they rose up. The Haitian Revolution raged for over a decade. But in the end, they were able to rid the country of both colonialism and slavery. And they changed the name from Saint-Domingue to Haiti. Fast forward over a hundred years later, in 1915, at the end of several other soft power attempts at control, the U.S. invaded and occupied Haiti. This helped put the island nation on the radar of the American public. Because for Americans, nothing puts a country on the map like going to war with them. Then in late 1928, zombies started to enter the popular consciousness. This is thanks in large part to the writings of W.B. Seabrook. The word went from being unknown to being used as a punchline within a matter of months. But like a lot of things in our culture, its biggest boost came from the movies. In 1932, the first zombie movie was released. White Zombie was loosely based on the Magic Island and was wildly popular. The film was shown consistently for years. 
And at this time, a zombie was merely a drone, a worker bee, an ant, mindless and servile, being controlled by a puppet master, cursed and undead, but not rotting, and not even the villain of the story. That role was reserved for the puppet master. A zombie was someone with no emotion, or motivations, or desires of their own. And in many ways, the zombies in early movies were the victims. This was more or less the concept of the zombie for a generation. In 1968, Night of the Living Dead started to change that. But it wasn't until Dawn of the Dead in the late 70s that the term zombie gets applied to the creatures in the Romero movies. Which mostly happened because the critics started calling the creatures zombies. And it's not until the mid-1980s that the zombie fully became the monster we think of today. In retrospect, we've come to refer to the creatures in the Night of the Living Dead as zombies. And the things that were called zombies in the movies before that are hardly recognizable to our modern eyes. Zombies? Yes. They are my servants. The early iterations of pop culture zombies didn't talk, or crave flesh, or make sudden movements. They only stared off into the middle distance, kind of like someone nursing a fierce hangover. In 1934, when Don came up with the zombie, it was created in this vein. To the 1930s American drinker, the drink's name called to mind images of tropical islands, beaches, and distant drumming. Zombies in pop culture hadn't morphed into the spontaneous herds of rotting cannibals that come to mind today. They were just the puppeteered drones, and they were still understood that way in the early 60s when Don tweaked his recipe to this streamlined one. The legend and popularity of zombie cocktails helped spread the tiki gospel far and wide. It was copied and trampled on by everyone getting in on the tiki game. Don's keywords and branding were all stolen to help bolster new bars and give them a head start with their PR campaigns. The recipes from Don's imitators were usually just a matter of dumping a lot of rums and juices into a glass and calling it good. However, Don was a tinkerer. He was known to change up his recipes. And depending on what you believe, he may have changed this drink quite a bit over the years only to end up close to where he started. This recipe comes from 1964, exactly 30 years after the original recipe was formulated. Both the 1934 and the 1964 recipes came from Don. There were a couple other formulations in between that may or may not have come from Don, but those are for another story. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This recipe came from the Aku Aku in Vegas, a bar Don was hired to set up in the early 60s. The Aku Aku was a tiki lounge in the Stardust Hotel, which burned down right after opening, but was renovated and reopened shortly after. The recipe was streamlined to equal measurements for most of the ingredients, plus a dash of bitters and half a teaspoon of a pre-batched mix to give the drink a little mystery and depth. This one bears a strong resemblance to the 1934 recipe, but with a heavier wallop of cinnamon spice in the body of the drink. Ingredient-wise, everything is pretty much the same as the 34 recipe. The only addition is curacao. Any orange liqueur will do, but if you keep a quality curacao on hand to make Mai Tais, you'll be all set. The rums used in the drink are the same as the 1934 version, only the measurements were adjusted to make it more reasonable. It's still strong, but not cranked up to ludicrous speed like the 34 recipe. For most people, the Jamaican and Cuban style rum should be pretty easy to track down, but the 151 Demerara might be challenging. If you can't find Hamilton or Lemonheart, sub in a heavier pour of a lower proof Guyanese rum, or an overproof blend with Guyanese in it or another flavorful dark rum. The important part is not to let it overwhelm you. It'll still be a tasty drink. Since it's a Don drink, the grapefruit the recipe calls for is white grapefruit, which is a little more mild than pink or red grapefruit. Just like the 151, white grapefruit can be hard to find. Your best bet is to try and find them at a farmer's market. But if you can't find them, you can just use pink instead. Either way, the key is to juice it fresh. After a couple days, it develops a bitterness that overwhelms the drink. Unlike the 34 version, the grapefruit and cinnamon syrup are broken up in this one. Cinnamon syrup is insanely easy to make, and it's an exciting component to a lot of other drinks, so it's definitely worth whipping up a batch. The only tricky part of the recipe is the zombie mix, 
The drink works best with such an oddly small amount of it that you'll want to batch it up ahead of time and use it when you need it. If you don't get through all of it in one sitting, it'll keep in the refrigerator till next time. It's all sugar and booze, so it should last for a good amount of time, but use your best judgment. If you want to be more like Don, you want to blend everything and pour it in your glass over more ice. But at home, I tend to use a shaker when I can get away with it. Also, if you want to be more like Don, you want to serve it in a 14 ounce zombie glass. That's how he'd serve it at his bars. And if you want to go the extra mile, pop in a vintage Aku Aku stir stick. This one's straight out of my grandfather's stir stick collection. But as period accurate as it is to serve it in a zombie glass, it's always fun to drink it out of a mug. And with this mug, you can have it either way, as it comes with a zombie glass and a skull-shaped mug, not to mention a glow cube. This dramatic mug, the Doom Altar mug, comes from Trader Brandon, a theme park designer and concept artist responsible for, among other things, Trader Sam's, the Disneyland Tiki Bar. He collected, curated, and shaped every detail in the bars of both the California and Florida locations. So it shouldn't be surprising that he came up with such a killer mug. It even comes shipped in a box that fits the theme. The mug is modeled after the altar that held the Sankara stones in Temple of Doom. Considering the source material, Indiana Jones seeking fortune and glory in India, this might seem like an unlikely mug to use for a zombie. But in the movie, the mysterious cult is practicing a dark religion that bears a strong resemblance to the pop culture interpretation of voodoo. And all the child slaves toiling in the mines, as well as Indy himself for a time, are under a spell that makes them do the bidding of the witch doctor priest. In other words, they're very 1930s zombie-like. Which is fitting because the movie was set in the 1930s. And just like other depictions of zombies, they do not like fire. In Temple of Doom, coming in contact with fire breaks the spell. So it's essentially a pastiche of early zombie tropes grafted onto some vaguely Indian hocus pocus. Besides, it looks awesome, especially with the glow cube, which turns on automatically when it comes in contact with liquid. Because this drink is an excellent variation on the original, and it's easier to make than the original, it's sure to be a hit. And one to put you in that, um, shall we say, zombified state. Before I get started, I like to chop, extract, strain, and bottle my citrus juice. That way it's easier to pour when it comes time to measure. Next, make your zombie mix. Combine equal parts absinthe, falernum, grenadine, and curacao, then mix them up. However, if you just want to make a single drink, measure out an eighth of a teaspoon each. The drink really does work best with the prescribed amount of zombie mix, so it might just be easiest to batch it first, but I'll leave that part up to you. Next, beat up some ice. Add some ice cubes to a Lewis bag and roll it up. If you don't have a Lewis bag, you can use a bar towel. Just fold it up so the ice can't escape. With the Lewis bag rolled, hammer it like you're boarding up your windows to keep the zombies out. Then whack the rim of your mug with the mint to release some oils and help give it that great aroma. Fill your mug with crushed ice. Measure out four more ounces of crushed ice and set that aside. Next, measure three quarter ounce of Jamaican rum, 151 Demerara rum, gold Cuban style rum, lime juice, white grapefruit juice, and cinnamon syrup. Add all of those to the shaker, hit it with a dash of aromatic bitters, and measure out half a teaspoon of zombie mix, and add that to the shaker. Add your four ounces of crushed ice, pop on the top, and give it a good shake to chill it down a decent dilution. Then pour it all unstrained into your mug. And finally, work in your garnish and your straw. It's important to put the straw back in the forest of mint. That way you get a big minty aroma when you sip the drink. And there it is. A drink that'll puppeteer you. The Aku Aku Zombie. Akole Maluna. If you want to download the Zombie Mix label, check out bonus videos, and support the channel, click on the Patreon link here, or in the description below. And in case you didn't get enough of me talking about the evolution of zombies at the movies, check out my new podcast, The Grindhouse Institute. Each week, my co-host and I break down a pairing of movies and discuss their common themes. We did a three-part series on how zombies evolved from being the victims to becoming the brain-eating monsters we know and love today. It's available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you find podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. 
for links, bar supplies, and more, as well as the printed recipe. Check out the description below. And if you haven't watched the other videos on this channel, there are over a hundred of them on here.